scenario to the social studies and um, And I ask your social studies teachers or uh, your other teachers to uh, attend today to meet my friend, uh, Ken Moynihan. Um, hopefully they've told you a little bit about him, but I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of story about him. Uh, why I do what I do and why um, I think it's important for you to meet that. Um, I've only been a teacher for about three years and every September 11th I tell my students um, about the folks that I know uh, that were directly affected by September 11th. Um, and this year, I'm fortunate because I have Dan here, um, had the opportunity to uh, give you guys an opportunity to hear from somebody who's actually there that day. And what he did on the day and what he's done in the days <coughs> after that. Uh, to me, the work that he has done since 9-11 is far more important. And the, the kinds of things that you all can and should think about when you get out into the world. But first a little bit about why I, every September 11th, give this talk, uh, is to remember the folks that I know who, like I said, were directly affected. I graduated from Putnam Hall High School in 1986, long time uh, Rich Lee was my classmate. Uh, I've known Rich since kindergarten. Rich was always the biggest kid in school. And classmates used to pick on him, thinking you know, like he was like Superman, like he didn't care. If he was too big, he couldn't hurt his feelings and stuff. But he was a sensitive guy. He was really, really smart. Um, <clears throat> played football, went home. Went home wasn't very good back then. He was really, really smart. Uh, graduated, went home, and uh, went to Yale. And on September 11th, he was in the North Tower. When I graduated from uh, Puno, I went to University of California. One of the guys I knew played on the rugby team. Mark Bingham was a sophomore in 1991. Mark was on flight 93, the one that crashed in Pennsylvania. What I know about Mark, and though we don't know all the facts, all the details, the story goes that the passengers there that day charged the cockpit after the terrorists had taken over. And because Mark was a rugby player, I can imagine he's probably the first guy. First guy running down the aisle to break down the door. Mark was that kind of guy. Your speaker today, Dan Moynihan. You want to call me lucky or unlucky for having known three people affected directly by 9-11? I don't know. I don't know if I'm lucky or unlucky. But Dan's here. And he's going to share with you a little bit about what he went through that day, why it's important to remember what happened. So Campbell. Uh, would you please welcome my friend? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a couple things that I'd like everybody to take away from here today. And number one is, of course, what happened on that day and the following weeks. Number two is what a group of friends of mine and I were able to take to do afterwards, and that is pass comprehensive health legislation for about 74,000 people afterwards. This is a group of my friends and I, quite a few years ago, probably mm, 25, 30 years ago. All of my friends at the Lost in the World Trade Center, many of them were volunteer firefighters as well as being New York City professional firefighters. I started out that day with my friend Jimmy, who I was just talking about up here. He and I were doing a Tropicana juice route. You know, Tropicana juice and the big box trucks, I don't know. They have other delivery routes just like it here on the island where we were rolling around, we were delivering juice uh, to different, uh, different stores and different delis. And uh, we didn't have the radio on the truck that day like we normally do. We were just talking, we were talking about baseball. And we were in a part of the city where the view of the towers were obscured, so we couldn't really see it. We heard sirens, didn't think too much of it because it's been happening here, sirens all the time. 
Finally, at one point in the day, I jumped out of the truck. He was driving, so I went and take the order. I looked up at the TV, which everybody was looking at, and that's when I finally saw the towers were on fire. I went out to the truck, said, Jimmy, turn on the radio. Jimmy gets to the, uh, the, the closest bridge. He's going to go across to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, the juice lot. He's going to get his Jeep and go to his firehouse in Brooklyn. We're stuck in traffic at the bridge. I looked, there's a, a subway station right there. I jumped out. I said, Jimmy, I'll see you later. He knows exactly what I'm going to be doing. He says, be safe. I said, you too. While this is transpiring, my friend Richie and his crew from Ladder 7 are arriving and going into the Marriott Hotel on the South Tower. This is Richie right here. This is the last photo taken of him. That's the very last photo taken of Richie. They would later die together on the South Tower collapse. So I'm, on the, I'm now on the subway, pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. I finally get down to 14th Street. They open the doors up, I run upstairs, I run across the two blocks <clears throat> over to 7th Avenue where there's an FBI agent who stops me. I show him my ID card, my fire department ID. He says, oh, okay, go ahead. A Verizon pickup truck pulls up, picks me up. Now, like I said, I didn't know since I'm in the subway that the South Tower had already collapsed. There's smoke and there's dust obscuring everything. So all I'm thinking is that the towers are burnt. Verizon truck picks me up. There's four guys in the back. There are the firemen. One guy's got work gloves. One guy's got dust masks. They eat sauce me work gloves and dust masks. We're on our way. <clears throat> so that photo of Richie and his guys are taken right about here. That's the hotel. This is the South Tower. This is what collapsed while I'm on the subway. We get dropped off at Murray and West Broadway, which is right here. I now look up and fully realize that both towers had now collapsed. And my first thought is, I wonder how many of my friends just died. Because I knew that those buildings were filled with my friends. Filled with firemen who now, had now just died when both towers had just come down. The remaining fire hydrants were taken up. So we had to find water, which meant we had to go into buildings and take water out of the buildings with the standpipes in, 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 the, uh, in the stairwells and use the water from the, from the uh, water towers up top. We had to get water from fire boats out of the river. We had to do relay systems with engine to engine to engine out of the river. We were starting to scour firehouses for equipment. There was a firehouse a couple blocks away. We took a, uh, a spare rig that we found. We went to the firehouse that we knew was pretty close. It was a big firehouse. And A, that's where I actually got a, a turnout coat and bunker pants and helmet for the day. All these cops and firefighters were calling home saying, I'm OK, click. I'm OK, click. I'm, and we got in line, got to me. I called out to Long Island, got my mom on the phone because everybody knew where it was and where I was going to be heading called home and said, I'm okay. Thank goodness, because they now knew I was alive. Got equipment, got what we could, and went right back. And about 2 o'clock or so the next morning, uh, I finally got pulled off to the, to the hospital <coughs> with smoke inhalation and dehydration and heat exhaustion. Uh, my blood pressure was through the roof. Uh, they finally yanked me away and said, you're going. I uh, got a couple hours rest. Um, I, they filled me with fluids, they fed me because I then suddenly realized that I was starving because I hadn't eaten since about 9 o'clock the previous morning. But when you're running on adrenaline, it's amazing what your body can do. Um, the doctor came over with my discharge papers and said, okay, if I sign this, you're not going back, right? <laughs> exactly. He knew what was going on. I said, oh no, doctor, I'm not going back. And he just closed his eyes and he signed it and he gave it to me. And I went right out and there was a policeman outside. And I said, you guys going back? Because this was in Brooklyn. They brought me to Brooklyn because they held all city hospitals for trauma cases, which were unfortunately not going there because there was, it was just simply weren't finding anybody anymore right then. All this heat and all this pressure, when they took samplings of the dust, they said, yes, we found all that stuff. But this was so unique. They found 32 new compounds they've never seen before and said, we have absolutely no idea what this is going to do to you guys. This is brand new. So now, for instance, there are 22 cancers that are related to working at the World Trade Center showing up in high, high, high numbers in people in their 40s, which should not be showing up in.
And we told them this, we're going to have more illnesses that are coming down the road because we're getting sicker and more of us are dying, but we're going to need more coverage. Once again, they're resisting that. We hit the airwaves. I was on Rachel Maddow five times. We were on John Stewart, who was one of our biggest advocates as well. Uh, however, one of our huge advocates in Congress was a King Wright, came from right here in Hawaii. Congressman Mark Takai from Hawaii first. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to become a very good friend with this gentleman. Unfortunately, he is a past now. He said, how dare you talk about closing down the government when our World Trade Center first responders are walking our halls telling us that we need to renew their health bill. I know you guys think that that can't happen, or it shouldn't happen, not in your United States, but it is, it does. Unless there's folks like Dan who go to war with Congress to get the bill done. So his request to you, his ask to you, is to remember. Not just his story, but all the stories. All the guys that are still sick and getting sicker, getting older, suffering all these new diseases from all these different new chemicals that they're still discovering. But they had to fight for that. Things that we know Congress should do automatically, right? That's the right thing to do. Well, it's not so, not so easy in Congress. The other things, the compensation, the things that he has to pay for out of pocket for his health care, Congress doesn't want to do it. Congress doesn't want to give his money back. Congress says, you're on your own. You pay for that. Washington, D.C., New York City, that's far, 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 far away. So maybe you think that what happens out there on the East Coast doesn't affect you. September 11th, 2011. You guys weren't even born yet. Right? Um, Just because something happened in the past doesn't mean it wasn't important. Just because something didn't happen in your lifetime and you don't know about it, doesn't mean it didn't, didn't happen at all. Of course it happened. What you do from here is important. It affects your community. In the case of Mark Takai, it affects the country. And some of you, your teachers bug you about, hey, community service, this and that. When your teachers bug you, hey, um, why don't you get your stuff done? You come up with some excuse. And I'm not asking you, and Dan's not asking you to run into a flaming building. Because if you ask me, that's not for everybody. Yeah. I mean, if you ask me, if you ask me on that day, could I do what Dan did? Could I run down to the pile, start digging through the rubble? It's not for me. I'm not trained that way. My mindset is not that way. But could I do something else? There's always that something else. Hey, and if you want to be a firefighter, if you want to join the Marine Corps, all power to you. I'm behind you. Yeah.